Thank you very much for this invite. It's um, always wonderful to talk to an interested audience. Um, my talk is on moving towards a global value chain perspective. This is quite an innovative um, idea. I will explain where it comes from. By the way, you can see that there's a Twitter name, if you can spell my name, <laughs> because there are about 10 different versions of my name in Google Scholar. So you are not the only one, even my relatives <coughs> find it difficult. Economic Social Research Council, which is the scientific body for social science research in this country, in collaboration with accountants, ACCA, have commissioned us a study to look at global organizations, the business case for diversity. As the previous um, uh, two speakers have highlighted, diversity does not always pay because um, we consider it a value, we get the best out of it, but it sometimes pays very generously because it is a form of exploitation. Diversity can be used as a form of exploitation. So my um, uh, presentation relates to that very topic. So the ESRC wanted us to look at the business case for diversity in globally significant organizations, and these were um, our research teams, and Ahu Tatla will be talking in the afternoon. We asked four very ambitious questions for our study. I'm going to highlight our findings very briefly. Does the workforce diversity lead to better performance? Most of the research today in management field focus on the connection between workforce diversity and performance. And I'm going to explain why this approach is rather naive. Secondly, what are the preconditions for effective management of diversity in order to generate positive outcomes from diversity? Third, is there a business case for diversity management at all? And how we should frame it? Finally, how is diversity management connected to the political economy? Really ambitious, as I said. <laughs> the problem with looking at diversity and performance, workforce diversity and performance, is that the picture is always partial depending on which category you select. For example, most of the research done to date has been in terms of gender. There is less in terms of ethnicity, and there is even less for, for example, sexual orientation. Some of, some of the categories are less attended than others in terms of our scientific knowledge. What we have done, we've selected 700 manuscripts, scientific, social scientific manuscripts, to look at um, uh, the correlations they have identified in terms of workforce diversity and outcomes. And there are also absolute silences in this field, particularly in the case of UK, class diversity has not been effectively measured, and we know that it's one of the silent killers in Britain. Not so silent, but it's a killer. Okay, when we've looked at the picture of the outcomes of workforce diversity, we were not able to satisfy our funders because the outcome was not simplistic. There were both positive and negative outcomes of workforce diversity. Unfortunately, we were not able to clearly say that workforce diversity will lead to better outcomes because at individual workforce and organizational levels, team and organizational levels, there were both positive and negative outcomes. I'm not going to dwell on those, but the full report is in the ACCA website. You can see the kind of uh, papers we have reviewed. But what then we did was to reframe our question. Initially, the proposal was about looking at the connection between workforce diversity and performance and innovation. And our evidence suggests that there is no such easy link to show a positive correlation. Diversity is like financial resources. Organizations can have financial resources and can use them effectively or not. So what matters in terms of the performance and diversity link is the effective management of diversity. So we decided to look instead, what are, the, what are organizations doing if, in order to effectively manage diversity to get positive outcomes? And we have identified that this effective management of diversity can only happen in a supportive environment. And support can take uh, many forms. Support can be internal, 
your colleagues can be receptive to it, your customers can be receptive to it. There can be top level support within your organization and the political context must absolutely support it. For example, when we looked at global organizations in different countries, organizations which did well were um, headquartered in countries which were heading the equality and diversity game. So political support, we can't um, understate, uh, overstate the importance of it. So I created this marvelous box. If you look at diagonally, organizations did some very basic things. If they had no support internally, externally, they could write a diversity statement, for example. But if they had more support, more legitimacy, they could move on to make structural changes, like the previous speaker, uh, the first speaker has highlighted. They could, for example, make their work practices more flexible, they could provide crash facilities, they could build structures. And finally, if they had real support internally and externally, they could move on to change cultures and change fundamental assumptions about work, how work is done, to make the workplace a home from ev for everyone, even uh, despite their differences. And we have then looked at what is the business case then if we think uh, that support is so essential. In the traditional sense, <coughs> when we looked at the uh, lit mainstream literature, business case for diversity is often defined as a connection between diversity and profitability, really narrow financial measure, and that's very problematic. This connection between diversity and shareholder value cannot be fully demonstrated and supported by scientific evidence. But yet some organizations were connecting diversity, not with shareholder value, but stakeholder value, to a wider number of stakeholders. Their impact, the impact of caring for diversity to a wider group of people, consumers, environment also, um, employees, not only their shareholders. Beyond this approach, there was also the compliance perspective that really few organizations adopted because they predominantly they saw diversity um, as a voluntary approach, that they did it not because it, it was enforced on them by law. That was at least their discourse. But some organizations cared about law and they have built um, safety nets for their workers caring for law in different national contexts. But what happens when we looked at uh, comprehensively, the most progressive organizations were doing something really new. They were looking at diversity from a process approach, from the inception of an idea, a product idea or a service idea, to its delivery in the value chain. For example, you can have fantastic top level, top team level diversity in the UK, but you may buy that at the expense of ex extreme exploitation in another country. So if you adopt the global value chain approach and see the whole process of the organization, you see fairness from a different light. You see diversity from a different light. So this new approach can fundamentally change the way we view uh, the business case for diversity. Let's come to more political aspects of our findings. In Britain, this is particularly the British case, we have a political economic system which is very much informed by neoliberal values. And those values, these macro political values have resonance and mirroring within um, organizations and in terms of the uh, diversity management field. There is a strong belief that organizations can regulate themselves without the force of law. And this voluntarism has been a very British um, approach in terms of political economy as well as diversity management. But we have identified that in some organizations, they were really looking forward to more progressive legislation to make changes because voluntarism has been responsible for the widening of the gender pay gap, for example, in this country. And that's why we have not been moving forward as our European counterparts. We are falling behind the game in terms of equality. And individualism, that's another value that underpinned um, 
our political ideology in recent years. And that means that some organizations frame diversity by looking at individual differences. When you do that, you reduce the power of the individual actors' negotiation in, um, in the face of, in front of employers. What you do by individualization is remove the community, element of community, element of networks from the diversity field. So some organizations resisted this and showed a response to this individualization by bringing communities in, bringing networks in. So treating diversity only as an individual attribute runs the risk of individuals losing out in terms of how they fare in their uh, negotiation with their employers. Competition is also a logic which has been quite detrimental in the field of diversity. Many of our sectors, which operated previously with service logics, for example, have been subject to competitive pressure. And that has brought about the sense of over-financialization. If we look at um, how we are operating in the UK in even um, uh, public sector and voluntary sector, service sector, we need to now financially account for our decisions before we can socially justify them. So we are moving away from social democracy to financial democracy, which is quite disturbing for the field of diversity. Because diversity decisions and equality decisions are far more important for us to leave them to in the hands of finance experts alone. So the response to this in some organizations has been to curb the over-financialization of diversity and not connect it only to the bottom line single bottom line arguments, but to connect to it to social wider range of logics. And one of those wider range of logics is the social morals, the other one is the uh, legal compliance, and finally, the global value chain, showing that we care not only about what happens within our um, small interest, small perspective, our own category of diversity, but adopting a transactional, uh, sorry, not transactional, intersectional approach. And even to think about solidarity in intersectional ways. One of the uh, problems with diversity field has been the focus on individual categories. We champion in organizations a limited number of diversity categories. Would it be possible, for example, to create an intersectional form of solidarity to move forward? Finally, um, I'm going to present you the conclusions of our general report. When we have gone into these global organizations and talked to them about their diversity approach and the business case, we've identified that uh, not only in Britain, but globally, there is a very adverse political context at the moment to diversity. Diversity has fallen out of grace in some countries. Others have made progress, and the progress has been sometimes the main uh, form of hindrance. If we look at diversity and equality, our achievements, if we compare ourselves to our grandparents, we have come far. But we are now in a, in a kind of a retrenchment mode, stepping back. It's like the march of the Ottoman um, army, two steps forward, one step back. And we are not going to leave um, labor markets full of equality to our children, not even to our grandchildren, if we do not get back into the game. So the key problem we identified also this in these organizations has been that they are reporting very easy achievements as their diversity intervention achievements. For example, women have been achieving um, senior level positions not because of the organizations, despite their organizations. And yet organizations report very happily on the improvement of uh, women in their boards. And when we asked what have you done for women lately, th there is very deep silence. You know, I, you can clearly see that I learned my English through songs. <laughs> <laughs> there is a push towards broadening the um, definition and scope of the business case, as I highlighted, we need to get organizational repertoires to move from simple but, uh, single bottom line arguments 
to value chain arguments because they are more critical and they are, we are likely to get them to do something, uh, we have more chances. And there's real, real urgency about this approach uh, because we need to create some form of solidarity to push the game forward. Equality and diversity has never been promoted by organizations on their terms. If you look at the key moments in our history, they have equality and diversity interventions have been galvanized due to very significant social trauma. Feminist movement, anti-racist movement in this country have been responsible for that. And more recently, the achievements we had in terms of uh, BME community has been uh, because of the Stephen Lawrence case. So solidarity is the message I would like to leave you with. It's the end of my presentation. Thank you.